Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin with the headlines first. Pakistan aims to destroy peace in Jammu and Kashmir through targeted killings. Human rights violations in Pakistan continue unabated. And POK Gilgit Baltistan face infrastructural education crisis. Targeted killings are a conspiracy by Pakistan to sabotage peace in Jammu and Kashmir. On April 22, a tragic incident occurred in the Rajori district of Jammu and Kashmir when a 40-year-old man was killed by gunmen. In another attack, a migrant worker from Bihar was shot and killed in Anantag. A telegram channel connected to the resistance front of lashkar e taiba took credit for the attack. The authorities are thoroughly investigating these incidents while taking appropriate measures to prevent further violence and loss of life. Take a look. A tragic incident unfolded in Jammu and Kashmir's Rajori district on April 22 as a 40-year-old man fell victim to a targeted attack. Mohammad Razak was rushed to a hospital after he was shot, but tragically, he succumbed to his injuries. This targeted attack echoes a painful history for the family, as Razak's father, Muhammad Akbar, was also killed by terrorists two decades ago. Police claimed a foreign terrorist codenamed Abu Hamza of the proscribed lashkar e taiba was involved in the killing of the government employee and announced a rupees 10 lakh reward for information on him. The group labeled the killing as a political statement coinciding with the election period. Another attack occurred a few days back where a migrant worker from Bihar was fatally shot in Anantanag. Responsibility for the attack was claimed by a telegram channel affiliated with the resistance front, a proxy of lashkar e taiba A fresh spurt of violence in Kashmir has cast a shadow over the polling fervor with series of targeted killings backdrop of the ongoing general elections in Jammu and Kashmir, Pakistan is greatly infuriated over the success of the polling process in the Indian state. And hence, it has stepped up its directions to the militants to whom it has been supporting for long to carry out attacks in Jammu and Kashmir in India. And that is the reason we have seen in the last few days Few such incidents have happened. This clearly shows the frustration of Pakistan. Targeted killings are a conspiracy by Pakistan to sabotage peace in Jammu and Kashmir. However, India remains committed to all efforts to combat terrorism by sharing intelligence, capacity building for effective border control, preventing misuse of modern technologies. In a massive crackdown in the Jammu and Kashmir terror conspiracy case involving Pakistan-backed banned terrorist organizations and their offshoots, the National Investigation Agency on April 22 carried out raids at nine locations in Srinagar. The digital devices containing large volumes of incriminating data and documents were seized during the raids conducted on the premises of hybrid terrorists and overground workers. Backed by their Pakistan-based masters and mentors, the terror outfits have been conspiring to carry out violent acts aimed at disturbing the peace and communal harmony in Jammu and Kashmir by radicalizing local youths and mobilizing overground workers. After Pakistan got defeated by India in the 1971 war, which led to the creation of a new nation, Bangladesh, Pakistan formulated a military doctrine called Bleeding India into Thousand Cuts. This doctrine is still day taught to the officers of the Pakistani armed forces. And under this doctrine is the support of terrorism in India. Till Pakistan will exist as a nation, it will continue to support 
and foment terrorism in India because it knows that it cannot defeat India in a conventional war single-handedly. Significant strides have been made in Kashmir since the abrogation of Article 370. The restoration of peace and increased developmental activities mark notable achievements when compared to the past. Pro-Pak terrorists are frustrated with the fact the public and social life in the erstwhile state in general, the valley in particular, are back to normal routine without disruption. However, India's External Affairs Minister S. Jay Shankar has declared that New Delhi is committed to respond to any act of terrorism perpetrated from across the borders. He has also asserted that since terrorists do not play by rules, there cannot be any rules in the country's answer to them. Ter terrorists do not play by any rules. The answer to terrorists cannot have any rules. The persecution of Ahmadis and the abduction of Christian Hindu girls are distressing examples of the challenges faced by religious minorities in Pakistan. It's crucial for international bodies and governments to continue raising awareness and advocating for the protection of human rights in the Islamic Republic. Recently in the UK Parliament, British politician David Alton raised the issue of violence against minorities in Pakistan and highlighted the incidents of abduction of Christian and Hindu girls. A report. Human rights violations are indeed a serious issue in Pakistan. The country has failed to ensure the protection and promotion of human rights across various aspects of society. Freedom of expression remains restricted with journalists, activists and dissidents often facing harassment, censorship and even violence for expressing their views. Religious persecution is another significant issue, with minorities facing discrimination, blasphemy accusations and violence. Forced disappearances where individuals are abducted by state or non-state actors without any legal process also contribute to a climate of fear and insecurity. Recently in the UK Parliament, British politician David Alton raised the issue of violence against minorities in Pakistan. Speaking in the parliament, Alton highlighted the incidents of attacks on Ahmadis and abduction of Christian and Hindu girls. Primitive and dismal conditions in the so-called colonies where Christians live, often devoid of running water, sanitation and electricity, in which I've personally visited with Mary Rimmer, Member of Parliament, and Jim Shannon, MP. The APPG has highlighted lack of reparations, convictions and impunity following the violence in 2023 in Punjab's Jaramwala, when a mob rampaged and torched churches and homes. I hope that the Noble Lord, the Minister, will respond to that and to the destruction of Amadi mosques and cemeteries, the persecution of the dead as well as the living, violent attacks including murder and the denial of comparable voting rights with other citizens. There have been instances in Pakistan where the state's ability to protect individuals has been questioned due to various factors such as political instability, corruption and the presence of militant groups. Speaking on human rights violations in Pakistan, Alton recalled that no one had been brought to justice for the murder of the Pakistan's Minister for Minorities, Shehbaz Bhatti, a Christian. On 2nd of March 2011, Bhatti was assassinated outside his mother's home for his opposition to Pakistan's blasphemy laws. Pakistan's blasphemy laws have been widely criticized for their misuse against religious minorities. Accusations of blasphemy can result in imprisonment, violence and even extrajudicial killings. In 2011, when the Christian Minister for Minorities, Shabazz Bhatti, and his friend Salman Tassir, the Muslim governor of the Punjab, spoke up for Asiya Bibi and called for reforms, both men were murdered. When did the UK last challenge Pakistan over the failure to bring the murderers of Shabazz Bhatti to justice? If you can't bring the killer of your minister for minorities to justice, 
Is it any wonder that the two children forced to watch a lynch mob of 1,200 burn alive their parents or minorities living in places like Jaramwala are in despair? But more hopefully, my lords, and here I will conclude, also recall that on August 11, 1947, in a famous speech, the great Muhammad Ali Jinnah insisted, I quote, you may belong to any religion, caste or creed, that has nothing to do with the business of the state. And Jinnah gave the newly independent Pakistan a new flag, symbolising the country's plurality and diversity, combining the Islamic green of its Muslim people with the white of the country's religious minorities. The flag's crescent represents progress. The five-pointed star symbolises light and knowledge, objectives which Jinnah hoped would inspire and unite the nation. Empirical research shows that countries which enjoy the greatest prosperity and harmony are the ones which promote religious freedom or belief for their minorities, something on which the UK, Pakistan and the Commonwealth should prioritise. Pakistan has faced criticism and condemnation from various human rights organisations and international bodies for its failure to adequately protect and promote human rights within its borders. Religious minorities in Pakistan often have limited representation in political and governmental institutions, which further marginalize their voices and concerns. Minorities face challenges in effectively advocating for their rights and interests. Efforts to address human rights abuses in Pakistan immediately need a combination of diplomatic engagement, international scrutiny and targeted sanctions. Let's now move to Balochistan, where human rights violations have been a matter of concern for several years. The region has seen allegations of enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrests and suppression of freedom of expression. The Baloch nationalists seek greater autonomy or independence for the local people. However, their movement has often clashed with the Pakistani government, leading to a cycle of violence and human rights abuses. A report. Balochistan, one of the least known dirty wars to the outer world. It is real example of loot, neglect and colonialism to this day. In the Pakistan's poorest province, generations are being wiped out and no one seems to care. The oppressive state has been recklessly targeting Baloch activists, protesting for their rights and the return of their loved ones. Cases of forced disappearances and extrajudicial killings have escalated to an alarming extent in Balochistan. The barbarism of Pakistan goes unnoticed because of media blackout in Balochistan. However, activists like Maharang Baloch are trying their best to raise awareness globally about the suffering endured by the people in Balochistan. When we use the term Baloch genocide, we are often told that it is an exaggerated expression and that there is no genocide in Balochistan. Today I say to all those that in a region where there is a graveyard of unknown mutilated bodies is established, where children search for their beloved fathers on their streets instead of attending schools. We are hundreds of peoples are collectively killed and their mutilated bodies are dumped in mass graves. We are women became victims of collective punishment and 80 years old mothers protest on the streets awaiting their children forcibly disappeared for the last 18 years. If all this does not constitute genocide in your eyes, then you need to create a new word in your dictionary for these atrocities. When people go missing in Balochistan, government calls they are cases of self-disappearances. Balochistan has a long history of marginalization. The province was annexed by Pakistan in 1948, soon after partition from India, and there has been a separatist movement since. Several Baloch armed groups have been fighting Pakistan's security forces for the province's independence for nearly two decades. 
One of the primary grievances among some Baloch groups is the perceived exploitation of the province's natural resources, particularly its vast reserves of gas, minerals, and other valuable commodities, with little benefit accruing to the local population. This has fueled resentment and demands for independence. The Baloch insurgency, which has intermittently flared up over several decades, has been met with military action by the Pakistani government. Balochistan is currently witnessing military operations, enforced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and forced displacements, which are affecting thousands of lives. In Balochistan, there are thousands of families whose family members have been enforcedly disappeared. And I think I don't need to provide any reference or evidence for this, because today in this conference, there are dozens of families before you whose loved ones have been enforcedly disappeared. Many families present here have relatives who have been enforcedly disappeared for more than 15 or 20 years. Even today, the number of victims the number of victims of forcibly disappear is in the thousands. And the most crucial aspect is that, that the person who is in forcibly disappeared not only endures difficulties, but the entire family of this person suffers for years. In December 2023, hundreds of Baloch people marched to Islamabad, protesting enforced disappearances and killings in Balochistan. Despite the Islamabad High Court's permission to stay and protest, the state used force, arresting and forcefully sending them back. Baloch activists are signing a petition urging the international authorities to take action on the ongoing genocide of their community members. They are demanding the United Nations and human rights organizations take action and hold the authorities accountable for the crimes committed in Balochistan. They further want a fact-finding mission headed by the United Nations Working Group to investigate the matter. It's crucial for governments, human rights organizations, and concerned individuals to speak out against the injustices in Balochistan and work towards meaningful change. Only through concerted efforts and solidarity, the deep-rooted issues facing Balochistan can be addressed. The regions of Pakistan-occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan face several challenges and issues that affect the local populations. There is a serious crisis in the education system as Pakistan has never prioritized learning and enlightenment in the occupied regions. Despite the pressing need for better facilities, students and employees in the education sectors are being kept away from their basic rights. A report. The international community has underestimated the socio-political and economic factors affecting the people of Pakistan's occupied Kashmir and Gilgit-Baltistan in the context of their occupied status and the country's inadequate infrastructure. POK and Gilgit-Baltistan have been illegally occupied by Islamabad since 1947 and the residents of these regions have endured the worst of Pakistan's political and economic hardships for many years. People are complaining about unfair tax increases, an unusual rise in electricity cost despite protracted blackouts and a crisis of vital services in the area that the state is fabricating. The situation regarding the education system in POK is alarming. There is a serious crisis in the education system as Pakistan has never prioritized learning and enlightenment in occupied regions. Despite the pressing need for better facilities, students and employees in the education sectors are being kept away from their basic rights. <laughs> سرکاری اداروں میں دو سے ڈھائی لاکھ روپے تک کی تلخائیں ادا کی جا رہی ہیں 
اور جبکہ تعلیمی ریزلٹ کی طرف دیکھیں تو ریزلٹ کی صورتحال بڑی پریشان کن ہے بورڈ کی پوزیشنوں میں پہلی بیس نمبر پہ بھی سرکاری اداروں کا کوئی طالب علم نہیں آ رہا اس میں دوسری طرف پرائیویٹ سیکٹر میں نہ صرف والدین اور بچوں کا رجحان اس طرف زیادہ ہے اور یہی وجہ ہے کہ پرائیویٹ سیکٹر بورڈ کی پوزیشنوں میں بھی پہلی پوزیشن میں جا رہا ہے اور لوگ بچوں کو پرائیویٹ اداروں میں بھاری برکاؤں فیسوں کے باوجود جو ہے نا وہ داخل کروا رہے ہیں Accusing the university administration of mismanaging the resources, students are complaining that they are not being provided any facilities. Shortage of faculty, transportation and classrooms are the issue that the students have been facing for several years. The local and federal governments have appealed by the academic staff multiple times, but their demands remain unfulfilled. اسی پرسنٹ سرکاری عمارتیں جو ہے جن میں آپ سو فیصد لگا رہے ہیں سرکاری اسکولوں کی عمارتیں وہ تو گر گئی تھی اور ان میں تقریباً پندرہ سے اٹھارہ ہزار بچے جو ہے نا وہ بھی شہید ہوئے تھے ان میں سے تقریباً ساٹھ فیصد عمارتیں تو بنی ہیں لیکن چالیس فیصد عمارتیں اسکولوں کی ابھی تک بنی نہیں سکی یا وہ زیر تعمیر ہیں اور ان کو ٹھیک داروں کو ادائیگی نہ ہونے کی وجہ سے وہ کام ادھورا پڑا ہے اور وہاں زیر تعلیم ہزاروں بچے جو ہے نا وہ کھلے آسمان تلے یا ٹینٹوں میں یا شیلٹروں میں The Pakistani government has refused to listen to the legitimate demands of academic staff and students as the progress in POK and Gilgit Baltistan does not align with Islamabad's objectives. Pakistan has transformed POK's educational institutions into sites of persecution. It views education as a threat to its illegal annexation of the areas as knowledge could help the locals understand their legal rights. Locals are speaking against load shading and inflation and demanding basic amenities in the area. The majority of demonstrators in POK and Gilgit Baltistan assert that while they do not intend to escalate their protest, doing so is their only remaining option for persuading the authorities. The locals from all walks of life are supporting the public cause in occupied areas of Pakistan. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We will be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Akansha Parimu signing off on behalf of the entire team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and